Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Project Stargate Friends Research. I am your host, Mark Brenner. Co-host Jake Malcolm here. And co-host Kaylin Bysbay. And we sure are glad to be back. And Jake, we're glad to have you back, sir. Um, why don't you give us a little snippet about what you've been up to the last several months uh, and uh, where you just got, got back from just uh, for the next few minutes? Yeah, so um, I've been out. I recently started a new job. Um, so that took a little bit of time to kind of get the ball rolling there. It took a lot of my time. Um, and then I actually was on a trip out to Las Vegas and took a little detour out to Area 51 while I was out there. So um, been gone for a while, but I'm back. Plenty to talk about. So we can uh, go ahead and get it going. That's awesome, man. We're going to um, we, we have about 10 minutes before our, our tonight's guest uh, comes on. Um, I wanted to say I want I want to kind of give him a, a little bit of an tell tell everybody a little bit about our guest tonight. Uh, tonight's guest, Dr. Melvin Morse. Uh, some of you, uh, our listeners, may be familiar with Dr. Morse. He uh, was for, featured on Unsolved Mysteries in a segment about near-death experiences back in the um, mid-upper 80s. Um, he was on a very, uh, the first segment they did on the subject, um, I believe it was in 1987, and it featured, uh, uh, the segment featured him, uh, Dr. Morse, talking about how when he he's a pediatric uh, do, uh, doctor, he would, did work with some pediatrics uh, in intensive care. Um, he he did a lot. He's done a lot in the medical field. Um, but he started seeing the having these things happen. He started seeing having situations where uh, a child under his care would report uh, uh, incredible experiences, um, journeys to other places that our minds can't even quantify. Um, it, it's just an amazing, amazing story. And also, uh, he was also a uh, scientist with the National Institute of Discovery Science, uh, Dr. Uh, or Mr. Bob Bigelow's um, uh, research group he founded when he owned Skinwalker Ranch back in the 90s. So we're going to have a very, very fascinating conversation here in just a few minutes. Um before we get started, before we, he's going to be with us in nine minutes, but we got a little bit of time. Uh, Jake, so can yes, you just tell us a little bit, just give us a little little snippet of what you did over in Nevada. I know you went to North Las Vegas. Um, yeah. What all, what all did, tell, tell us about, just give us a little little something to chew on until next week. Yeah. What did, what did yes. you do? What did you see? So went out, um, basically was out there running around uh, by myself. I went out there with my mom. It was actually family wanted to go out to Las Vegas. She had a uh, uh, business meeting out there. So I've got to thank her for that. But I was the only one who was able to get the time to go. So I basically had six days in Las Vegas by myself. Um, oh. So I, I smacked as much as I could in, into my schedule. Um, went down to Fremont Street. Uh, that was a really good time. Um, from there, I went to the Mob Museum, had a whiskey tasting there. Um, went to Area 51, which was probably the coolest part of the trip. Uh, took a nice, nice trip out there, a tour, a private tour with a uh, couple of folks. You know, there was only four of us in the tour um, in this luxury SUV driving through the desert, going to all these stops. So it was that was really cool. Um, I saw some cool I'll, pictures you posted, which we yeah, ought to, we ought to yeah. show those next uh, when we do our next um, pro podcast. Um, I can't. Yeah, I so. saw some of those pictures. Those are those were incredible, especially at the little alien uh, and Rachel. I yeah. saw you made it to Rachel. Yeah, we made it to Rachel. We uh, we stopped off at the little alien for lunch, um, and it's I I didn't know this. It's all family owned, so everyone working in there is either a cousin or a grandparent or something. So it was really cool experience wow that's incredible yeah. a lot of, a lot of people some people that we've had on our program have uh, our frequent guests there uh yeah we some of our uh I, I know a lot of people uh a lot it's a lot of our colleagues uh or or visitors there or they've been there quite a bit i'm i that's a that's on our my bucket list i i just i really want to go i want to sit there and have lunch and just talk about weird stuff you know what it I mean? It was cool. 
that's exactly what we did. You know, our tour guide brought a bunch of, uh, you know, newspaper clippings and all sorts of stuff um, from the area about different UFO incidents. Uh, you know, we went to both gates. We went and watched the Janet flights. Um, we went to the black mailbox. We did it all while we were out there. So now I heard uh, confirm or deny. Did they take yeah. the black mailbox down? So the black mailbox story is kind of a long story. So um, the black mailbox was there um, and people eventually it started getting plastered up with stickers and people were stuffing stuff in it. And uh, eventually, yes, the original owner took it down. Uh, the black mailbox was actually to a, uh, a cattle ranch out there. Um, so what he did is he went out and he put out two mailboxes after that. And one was to him and one he addressed to area 51. So that is the one that's still out there. The actual black mailbox. Um, you can go and you can send your letters and whatever to the aliens while you're out there. Um, so the original one, yes, is gone, but there is one that is in its place now that looks like it, but is much bigger. Wow. So that's cool that they, uh, I wonder if the owner put it up there or, or if someone else actually. The owner did. Oh, the that's cool. Did. That's yeah, that's really yeah. cool, man. That yeah, he, so he, put he one respects for that. Yeah, he put one for himself and put one for the tourists. That was very thoughtful, actually. That was yeah. extreme. He didn't have to do that. You know, that, right. that, that black thought, mailbox that means, awesome. means a lot to people, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's cool. Well, um, um, I, oh, one, sorry, one more ahead. thing. One more thing I'll add is. Um, so, you know, the famous extraterrestrial highway sign that's covered in stickers, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, about a week before I went out there, uh, a guy driving a semi truck um, missed his turn and turned too sharp and actually took that sign out. Oh, um, man. Oh, no. So the, sign, the sign I'm in front of, they actually put a new one out there. I think it was someone in the town of Rachel. Those are the private signs. So they just go and they just put another one up there. Oh, Lord have mercy. So Man, they replaced nice. it. They've got one on either end of the highway now. I was about to send Kalen over there to fix it for us. Yeah. <laughs> he, 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 uh, he, he, Kalen's the man. Uh, we, we're going to be planning out, uh, we, before, like we were talking earlier before we started our recording, um, we, uh, we're planning our Halloween outing and we're all going to get to go out together for the first time. That's going to be fun. We're going to get, we're going to hit Booger Mountain. Uh, we're gonna hunt, hunt, uh, hit the Memorial Cemetery, uh, blazing, mm -hmm. guns blazing, not literally, but with our with all our, all of our gear. Um, it's gonna we're gonna have, and the good thing is, is you're you're actually experienced using a lot of that gear, uh, Malcolm. So mm -hmm. I, I I just can't wait to I can't wait to learn how to use uh, some of this equipment that I, I spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars on that I, that. I, I just don't know how to use and and this is going to be a very educational experience for me as well um to to celebrate the fall and we're going to be out there uh my my you know my teenage daughter she's coming she's excited about it um she's actually used a few of, the, uh, of my toys she's used the uh uh non-read digital readout uh emp detector or emf detector she i mean everybody almost anybody can use that but uh Anyway, it's gonna be it's gonna be a great outing. Um, Dr. Melvin Morse, he's gonna be with us here in just a moment. Uh, we're going to we're going to pause just for a moment, and he's gonna be with us in just a moment. So we'll, we're going to take this moment to to uh, to take a to take a short break, and then when we come back, our guest today's guest, Dr. Melvin Morse, will be with us on Product Stargate Friends Research. We'll be right back. All right, and we're back here uh, on Project Stargate Fringe Research with my co-hosts, Jake Malcolm and Kalen by Spaith. Welcome back, guys. And uh, it's time for us to talk about, bring on our guest, uh, Dr. Melvin Morse. He is a, he's a medical doctor with many, many years of research um, with, uh, in the realms of parapsychology, near-death experiences. Uh, he was also a NIDS uh, a scientist, and he worked with NIDS uh, back in the 90s, I believe it was, on, at Skinwalker Ranch. Um, Dr. Morse has, has many wonderful credentials, and we'll let him uh, talk about 
uh, anything he wants to talk about as far as some of his research and investigative uh, work. Um, Dr. Morse, welcome to the program. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you so much. It's just such a pleasure. We're glad to have you, my friend. Um, we, Dr. Morse, you now before we get into your back, I want to get into your background a little bit. But before we we kind of start, uh, you you tell us about your background a little bit in a little bit of detail. Um, you, there's there's several bullet points that's gonna that's gonna formulate what we're gonna talk uh, a lot of the stuff we're talking about. Would you like to go ahead to introduce that for us before you yeah, tell us absolutely. about your background? Um, well, they they're sort of intermingled, so I'll, I'll sort of uh, I'll, I'll sort of you know uh, lump them all together for you. Um, I'm a former critical care physician, and I worked out of Seattle Children's Hospital for many years. I worked for uh, Airlift Northwest, and we flew uh, to uh, Idaho and to Alaska and such as that, and br- bringing uh, critically ill children back to Seattle Children's Hospital. And I resuscitated a young girl in Pocatello, Idaho, and uh, she was she was clinically dead. I mean, there's no, you know, the, uh, her pupils were fixed and dilated. She had a Glasgow coma score of three, which very few people survive from. And yet she did survive. And I happened to see her in follow up a couple of weeks later. Uh, I just happened to be working at a community clinic out there for sort of unrelated reasons. And um, she looks at me and she tells her mother, she says, hey, that's the guy that put a tube in my nose. And uh, yeah, and she uh, gave a blow by blow accurate description of her uh, resuscitation. Uh, including uh, you put me in a big machine that looked like a donut, which was her description of the CAT scanner. Uh, she recounted accurately a conversation I had with uh, the my supervising doctors at Seattle Children's because um, we, we were kind of flummoxed as to what to do with uh, her. And um, she, uh, uh, you know, I was saying to them, what, what, you know, what, what should I do next? You know, should we continue uh, resuscitation efforts? Uh, you know, should we pull the plug, whatever? And uh, she recounted all of that. And then I looked at her like, you know, come on, you know, I was like, whoa, what is this? Uh, were you and tripping she out when me. she said that? Were, were, were you just completely? Yeah. yeah. Uh, right. I was just, <laughs> and, and she pats me on the wrist and she goes, you'll see, Dr. Morse. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> She's, repeat that again. Heaven is what? She says, you'll see, Dr. Morse, heaven is fun. <laughs> oh, man, that is so incredible. And how old was this kid? So she was seven. Oh, man. Wow. Go ahead. Continue. So uh, this just totally, uh, th- you know, I trained at Johns Hopkins. I was, you know, I was totally unprepared for this sort of thing. Um, I had no frame of reference to put it in at all. I, I grew up a Jewish, but... Uh, you know, I grew up in the kind of household, you know, that many Jewish families are really agnostic, you know, really didn't have much of a belief in God at all. Uh, and uh, certainly, you know, I mean, we went to services from time to time, but I was just like, wow. <laughs> and uh, being uh, that young. That was paradigm ambitious, shattering for you, I bet. Right. I wanted to see, uh, you know, what this was all about. And I was in a perfect uh, position to do it. Uh, being uh, in the intensive care unit at Seattle Children's Hospital. So we went on to study all survivors of cardiac arrest at Children's Hospital over a 15-year period. Um, And, uh, you know, and we, you know, so so unlike the studies at the time, um, you know, where people, you know, Raymond Moody, who happens to be my brother-in-law, incidentally, so I'm no way! Anything You're negative right. about him. <laughs> yeah. I know who I know who he is. I, I, anybody who's yeah, studies, I've, I've known that, Raymond. Crazy. For, I've known him for years, but um, and then yeah, you know, I married his uh, sister-in-law. But um, you know the, the sort of studies he did were, um, uh, you know, he would give lectures and people would come up after his lectures and they would tell him their experiences. Well, you know, obviously, you know, you're going to get only a certain kind of person that's going to you know, do that sort of thing. 
So, uh, you know, and we were quite skeptical at the time. We thought that we were going to show that these experiences were caused by uh, anesthetic agents, which can cause patients to have dissociative reactions, you know, to think they're out of their body and such. Mm-hmm. Um, and we wanted to really do a, a meticulous study. So, you know, so instead, we uh, simply interviewed survivors of cardiac arrest. And we found, uh, and, and we carefully compared them to control patients. Um, so, um, uh, you know, that also had a lack of oxygen to their brain. Also, uh, were treated with all sorts of uh, potentially uh, dissociative uh, causing uh, drugs, um, you know, morphine, um, you, know, you know, all of that. And yet they weren't near death. And so um, we, uh, we were shocked at our findings. Uh, 24 out of 27 of our patients uh, that we studied uh, described some sort of near-death experience. And, and this was totally, it was, it was really, it was, like a, it was like discovering an astonishing secret. Most of these children hadn't even told anybody. Um, <laughs> I asked one little girl why she didn't, and she said, well, I didn't think you were supposed to be able to talk to God. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, you know, it was really, it was uh, really a startling. And I'm always kind of irritated by, you know, when people say, well, you know, these, you know, the study, of these experiences aren't scientific or, you know, this isn't science or blah, blah, blah. I still read that kind of thing on Facebook. We published uh, our findings in the American Medical Association's pediatric journals. So, I mean, you know, from the, you know, the very mainstream and, and our study was done. I was a fellow, you know, uh, at the time, but uh, the head of the intensive care unit, the head of the department of neurology. Wow. So, you know, all, you know, all right. And so our, our findings are pretty rock solid and they were followed up by uh, an adult uh, by a researcher named Pin von Lummel, a cardiologist uh, in Holland, and he published his results in the Lancet. So, you know, there's just no doubt that the near-death experience is the dying experience. It's going to happen to us all when we die. So, anyway, so uh, we're getting around to why I'm on your paranormal show. I'm getting there. Sure. Um, take, no, so, take your time. I'm enjoying this. This is great. Well, here's what happened then. So, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, since we've got two hours, I'm going to tell you this story because it's just an incredible story. Please do. Um, yeah, one of the... Uh, one of the patients that we interviewed, remember, we just, all we knew was that they had survived the cardiac arrest. Right. You know, that's, you know, we just pulled their charts uh, or, you know, you know, if, if they had had a cardiac arrest, uh, this patient uh, had a cardiac arrest during the time of our study. So, you know, we waited a couple of weeks after he recovered and then we went out to interview him uh, and his mom. So they were driving home in the middle of the night uh, the parents are ski instructors uh, on the Cascade Mountains uh, in, uh, in the near Seattle, Washington. And they're, they, it's, uh, you know, heavy snow. Visibility is, you know, maybe a couple hundred yards. And they're driving down and they hit a bridge, of, uh, you know, the guardrail for a bridge. And they flip over uh, into the water below. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's a river is, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a bridge over a river. But the amazing thing is that some guy is following them and he's just following their lights. You know, that's, that's what's telling him where the road is going. So he's driving along and then suddenly their lights disappear. And so this guy had the, um, I don't know, you know, whatever you call it. I mean, it's just, well, he was a hero. I mean, he, he actually then pulled to the side of the road and he's like scratching his head. Where did, where'd those lights go? And then he looks over the, you know, over the, the guardrail and he mm. sees the car uh, down uh, in the river below. Oh boy. And uh, calls uh, 911. And then he himself goes down there. And, uh, you know, dry, dives down in the cold water uh, and uh, rescues uh, the Chris uh, Eggleston, is the uh, young man's name, uh, rescues him, uh, uh, eventually rescues the mother. 
Praise uh, God, and man. Then the, That's awesome. Uh, well, the father then uh, perished in the car. So, oh, that's terrible, man. But this mm. is what started me on kind of the rest of my journey. Was um, well, first of all, I, I feel so. I, I just feel so. I, I feel both blessed and also a burden of. Uh, I think I have a responsibility to share these stories with people because I heard them for the very first time. And, you know, you hear these stories and, you know, they just all sort of sound the same and you sort of wonder, well, is everybody just sort of copying everybody else's story? And, you know, you just wonder whether, you know, particularly when it's coming from adults, are they just kind of making this stuff up? But (laughs) I I asked this this young man, what did he remember uh, about uh, his experience? And he says to me, well, I was floating in the air and then I went into a huge noodle and then his face kind of wrinkles and he goes, no, no, it couldn't have been a noodle because noodles don't have rainbows in them. (laughs) And, (laughs) you know, so you know, he's not making that up. And, you know, you know, and then later on he, you know, he goes, oh yeah, it must've been a tunnel. And then whenever he tells the story again, he says it's a tunnel. But just what I meant by do you mind if I interject something really quick, Doctor Morse? With that, do yeah. you mind if I comment on something? I apologize for interrupting you. Uh, sure. I just really need to to express this real quick. Um, I've looked at tons and tons of cases. I mean, uh, I'd, I'd say close to fifty. I, I would say to be accurate, somewhere around fifty, sixty of them. Um, one of them, what I've seen, the most common scenario, what I what I've seen, what I've noticed, and you can ver- tell me I'm full of crap or 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 I'm dead on with this, but it seems like the same general things happen in almost everybody's experience, but each experience seems to be personalized. That's like, what I'm getting at. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I, I have learned in so my vividly in children. Yes, sir. And when you hear it for the first time, that's why I'm telling you, I feel like I have a responsibility to share this because, you know, now, you know, I mean, I've heard him tell the story many times. And he only talked about the noodle one time. You know, that was the first time he said it. He goes, I was in a huge noodle. (laughs) And then, uh, you know, I mean, so that, you know, that tells you, you know, just like what you're saying, you know, the, you know, that's the mark of of true authenticity is that, you know, he's struggling to explain what it is he was, uh, you know, and then he finally comes to say it's a tunnel and then that's, you know, and then that's the way he tells it from then on out. But hearing it that first time, uh, you know, tells me uh, there's something you know, really uh, real was going on. And that's what he said to me. He says to me then, but was it real? Meaning, was his near-death experience real? It was real to him and nothing else. Yeah. He, he said, because if it was real, you got to tell all the old people. <laughs> and so that's what then led me to cool. move forward because I wanted to know if this experiences were real. You know, I really took his uh, question seriously. And also it has such a meaning for grieving parents. Oh my God, I mean, it's, yes. you know, I don't feel that I could tell, you know, grieving parents with a straight face about these experiences unless I could address that issue. But you know, are they real? Are they, you know, they're hallucination of the brain? Are they, you know, some sort of, I don't know, you know, uh, you, know uh, uh, you know, dying dysfunctional event, uh, you know, uh, flooding the brain with, you know, different, uh, you know, uh, neurochemicals, or is it some sort of real experience that we have at the end of life? And now I'm getting to <laughs> the, 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 the points that I wanted to hit on when we start to talk about, you know, the greater uh, issues uh, that surround near-death experiences, you know, such as uh, UFOs uh, and, you know, the whole paranormal uh, uh, field of uh, study. And that, that issue is, is what is real? You know, and we, we've got to answer that question first. And, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but we have all the time you need, doctor. You take you, you just you go ahead with whatever you want to talk about, brother. We have all the time you need. All righty. Well, then here's the deal. The first thing we have to understand 
is that we don't see reality. We're not, you know, our eyes are not video cameras. You know, our ears aren't microphones. Reality is perception. Exactly. So that's what it is. Uh, you know, the theoretical physicists tell us that reality is this, this electromagnetic field that's timeless and spaceless, where everything's happening all at once. And then we sample that electromagnetic field with our biological sensors, with, you know, our, uh, you know, their uh, retina and uh, you know, the, very, the organs in our ear and, uh, you know, et cetera. And then all of that is coded into neuroelectro, you know, bioelectrical signals. And then they go to our brain and our brain just sits there in darkness and gets all this information and then creates what we think is reality. I think what we and call our brain is like a, is like a, like a biological processor. I think our consciousness may be remote or, or separate in, as energy. In, in, but it has to but be. connects to it because it, it makes there, sense there to can't me. Be, right, there can't be any other explanation, um, and certainly people have got to get away from this idea that what they perceive is somehow real. It's not. Um, it's entirely created. It's like a physical and matrix by our brains, and it's created out of what we think is possible, out of what we think is real. So that's why when uh, Chris Eggleston is struggling to process an experience he's never experienced before. Well, first he's trying to put it into something that he, you know, that is already within his mental model. You know, we, we, we have created this mental model of reality and then we spend all our time trying to, you know, fit whatever we perceive into that mental model. And so that's why he at first goes, Oh, you know, it was a noodle I was in. You know, and then and then as he gets more information from other people, then he goes, no, it's a tunnel. But that's very similar to the process, for example, in which we um, identify the color red. You know, when we're little, you know, we don't actually see red doesn't appear in nature. Red is, is something we create in our brain. And we have to then, uh, you know, our parents or, you know, whatever have to constantly tell us. You know, that wavelength of light you're seeing, that's red, that's red, that's red, that's red, that's red. And it takes a long time. And, you know, so that's, that then uh, brings up the problem, though, of what happens when we see things that aren't in our mental model and how difficult it is to fit them into our mental model. And, to, you know, to just skip ahead real quickly uh, to illustrate why this is important um, people that saw UFOs in the late 1800s saw sailing ships in the sky. That, that's what they described, you know, actual sailing ships, you know, with, with, with uh, you know, canvas uh, uh, sails and, you know, wooden, uh, you know, wooden hulls, you know, et cetera. Whereas today, when we see UFOs, nobody sees sailing ships anymore. You know, instead they see, um, uh, you know, well, they see balls of light or, you know, Right. You know, what, what, what our culture and our society thinks that they should be. Jake was at Area 51 uh, uh, last week, by the way. Oh, really? What I was. was. Like? It, was um, it was a very interesting experience. Um, eerie would probably be the best way to put it. But it was it was definitely very cool, and I highly recommend taking a tour out there sometime. I'm sorry for interrupting well, you, Dr. No, it's not. It's, they are not interruptions. They're all. This is all sort of interwoven material. It is, and, and I think that's that's the, what our conversation is going to culminate by the end of this show. <laughs> but and you know, and, and and I'm very used to it because as soon as I started lecturing on near death experiences, immediately people start free associating to other paranormal experiences. And they're doing that because, you know, not because they have some camaraderie with people who study the weird, but because there is some sort of link. There's, um, so that comes to now the second point that I want to. So the first point is we don't really perceive reality. 
So uh, we create a mental model of reality, and then uh, you know the uh, and people if, if anybody that wants to study UFOs and near death experiences first should learn about the brain, and they should watch this PBS series by a guy named Eagleman, a neuroscientist named Eagleman. It's called The Brain. And then you then people would get off of this whole thing of well I don't understand because you know you're saying you saw this and this other person saying that he saw that and so that must mean you both are just making it up instead of you both are struggling to explain something that's outside of our cultural mental model. Okay, next thing that is up is um, we only represent about 20 or 30 percent of everything that exists. Uh, we know now that we can't see about 70% of the matter in the universe. Uh, the rough, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, a decade from now, they'll have a different percentage. Um, but, you know, that's their rough guess right now. Well, is it what because is of the that? light spectrum? Is it because of like, like they had, they vibrate on different frequencies or is it because uh, like they're the light they admit uh, is, is out of the, our spectrum? What do you think that is? It's that they're actually they actually are made of, um, you know, a, a real physicists who are hearing this, you know, going to probably barf. But so, so but what I'm telling you is is roughly correct. Uh, there's uh, you know, we're made of classes of subatomic particles and uh, certain classes of, of quarks, uh, you know, which is the, you know, one of the uh, lowest levels of subatomic particles and they have a particular spin on them and a particular uh you know subatomic structure and there's other categories of subatomic particles that um you know so they sometimes they call it antimatter or you know uh what have you but there's uh I mean, so it's not even that they're emitting light that we can't see, but they're actually made of classes of subatomic sub particles that we can't perceive, that um, that really only exist in theory uh, in uh, this universe. But we know that the matter is there, uh, and it, they calculate it by the measurements of the expansion of the universe and uh, such as that. And they know that it's all around us. So it's not like there's, you know, it's not like this section of the universe, you know, is all the reality that we can perceive. And then there's some other section of the universe that's the invisible section. No, the invisible matter is all around us. And so since it's made of the same types of subatomic sub particles that we are, then why wouldn't in those other, uh, uh, you know, uh, they're not even separate universes. I mean, they're in this universes, but those those other domains, I guess, would be a better word. Why wouldn't they have also evolved, uh, uh, you know, conscious life? Uh, well, I have a certain, theory about uh, that I want to throw at you uh, along those lines later in our program. I I, just, I, have, I can't wait to tell you about this. It has to do with the uh, fourth dimension. And uh, but go ahead. Yeah, but you know, so but right now we're not talking about the fourth dimension, which then is adding even another level of complexity, or we're not talking about the multi, you know, verse uh, theories, which um, you know, again, you know, like that's Max, a whole different podcast, Mark, right there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the right that, but uh, you know that, uh, but we're talking about within this universe and with this and within this reality that. There's matter, which is every reason to believe that it's also, uh, you know, evolved conscious beings just like us or very different than us, and that it's all around us, that it's right next to us, that they're capable of, you know, of hearing our words right now for all we know. And so, you know, with, with that in mind, then we have to be kind of humble when people say they see angels. Maybe they do. You know, maybe they're just seeing, uh, you know, that they're able to see or sense in some way um, right. this, uh, uh, you know, the, the, this this matter that's dark to most of us. So that's the second point. And then the third point I want to bring up uh, came from um, my uh, learning to do controlled remote viewing. 
And the reason I learned to do controlled remote viewing was because children had told me that when they're in this near-death state, um, you know, when they've, uh, you know, their, their brain has died, so they're free of the physical brain, they feel like they're in a universe in which there's all information and all knowledge and that a loving God yes. is there with them. Yep, that's that, well, that's the I can't really, uh, you know, I can't work, you know, the, I mean, the concept of the, of the loving God, I think is, you know, that's ultimately to me, at least I think going to be a matter of faith, but this issue of, is there truly an informational universe that we all have access to? Well, that's what controlled remote viewing is all about. And if it's true that we can do controlled remote viewing, then it's true that we can access this uh, informational uh, universe. So uh, it sounds to me like your listeners are probably uh, familiar with controlled remote viewing, but um, yes, uh, they, let me just are. review it real quickly Please. because it's so astonishing. I mean, it, it's really, uh, I, I now teach controlled remote viewing and I can tell you that every time that I either do it or see someone do it, I'm blown away. Because what wow. you do is you start, well, you start with a number. So, so you start with, let's, you know, an eight digit a number, and that number is tied, let's say, to the Eiffel Tower. But the person who's doing the viewing, we don't tell them that it's the Eiffel Tower, we just give them the number. But the number has been, uh, is sort of like its, its, its address. You know, it's, it's been added to the information that is the Eiffel Tower, you know, so, so the Eiffel Tower, you know, it's, you know, it's a, it's a heavy structure, it's metallic, you know, all those sensory pieces of information. And then it has another piece of information too, which is this eight digit number. And so that's, so the viewer, that's all you give them. You give them that eight digit number. And sure enough, as they go through the controlled remote viewing protocol, uh, by the time it's over, they're able to give you an excellent description of the Eiffel Tower. That's incredible. But that's like Project Stargate. Um, that's what yeah, we named our, the show that's after. What we named it after. About, right. Yeah, that, that's why we, that's why we named uh, our research group Project Stargate. Yeah, I named it after that because it's just so remarkable what, what was done. Well, are you now? Are you are you uh, doing controlled remote viewing? I am not, but uh, I am. I, I'm actually in the process of, of trying to research it. Uh, my wife, the, the, the most I've done, I've, I have a deck of Xener cards, and I've tested my wife on it, and we got some astounding results just with the simple Xener card approach to yeah. clairvoyance. Uh, I can tell, I want to, to tell you about that um, later another time. But, yeah, I am very interested. Block in off an afternoon, and I'll teach you to uh, remove you. You got it. Seriously. Thank you. You've got to do it. Just It'll, it, it, it'll take me... Uh, you know, five or six hours, and I'll get you through one remote viewing session. Uh, you know, it's not the same as taking, you know, a four-day course from Lynn Buchanan or Paul Smith or something like that. But, I mean, it'll I would be honored, have one man. session that'll uh, blow your mind. Yeah. Because here's the deal. So, so why did I bring this up on the issue of, you know, this guy says, this young man says to me, but was it real? Okay. So you start with a number and you construct the sensory information about a remote target. Notice that you can't say it's the Eiffel Tower. In fact, you can't pick up any nouns in the process of controlled remote viewing. Well, now that that's why now you see why I started off by telling, uh, explaining what is the nature of reality, because the nature of reality is that we bring in sensory information and then our brain decides what it is. You know, we bring in sensory information and our brain says that's a pencil. We bring in sensory information and our brain says that's a phone because it's had it's dealt with lots of phones before. Uh, you know, that this is you know, this is how it defines a phone. So the only information that you can really get from a remote target is sensory information. And then there's a very important concept in the remote viewing world called analytic overlay. An analytic overlay is when the brain struggles to make sense of the information that's coming in, but it does it prematurely. 
So, for example, I'm huh. getting information on the Eiffel Tower. Well, the brain wants to, you know, I'm going to get to point four in just a second. I'll, I'll give you a preview of it. The brain has a very hard time just saying, I don't know. It's very difficult for the brain to just say, I don't know what, you know, what, what the hell that is. The brain typically will make something up rather than admit it doesn't know something. And I'll explain more of that in just a moment. But like random thought patterns? It, exactly. So, okay. so here you're, so you're getting information from, let's say, the Eiffel Tower. Your brain jumps the gum and says, oh, no, it's the Seattle Space Needle. And so then your brain starts to graft its own information into it. Oh, I hear the ocean. Oh, I hear, you know, this, uh, the monorail, you know, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, in Seattle. Oh, I'm getting more information. Uh, but it's not getting that information at all. It's just making that stuff up. So that's called analytic overlay. And that, uh, that's what the process of controlled remote viewing, you have to learn how to screen out the analytic overlay. And it's, it's a wonderful exercise. Uh, you know, it'll help you to develop your own intuition. It helps you to separate in your own life the difference between your emotional perceptions and your true intuition. But it applies here because this explains why then, uh, I don't know, somebody gave me a website the other day of uh, a person who had a near-death experience and then saw all these levels of heaven and hell and all these dimensions of reality and all this kind of stuff that just went on and on and on and on. And all I could think was, what a lot of analytic overlay. But that doesn't mean that the core experience that he was having isn't real. It is. It's just his brain has now grafted stuff onto it. So in the remote viewing world, they call that sandcastling, where you sort of just, you know, invent and build a sandcastle out of nothing. And it and usually like the first thing that pops of... in your head, like when you're trying to remote view a target. I've heard I've heard some parapsychologists say stuff like that. Uh, is that accurate or is there just or is there just different techniques on how to do it? No, <laughs> the, the controlled remote viewing uh protocol is really the only protocol that has ever been shown to accurately uh, and reliably and reproducibly uh, remote view. Um, I'm not aware of any. Well, we did a study. I, I did a study of. Uh, I didn't I mean to get us off track. I, I apologize. No, that's a that's a, because. No, that's not off track. That's to the point, because the point is that when things pop up into your head, usually they're analytic overlay. Usually they're just stuff that your brain has made up. And unfortunately, people get that into their mind that that must be true. And that's what happens to mediums. That's what happens to psychics. That's what happens, uh, you know, that's why the people are constantly arguing over UFO phenomena. Well, what you saw wasn't real, what you saw wasn't real. Even in the near-death world, they'll say things, well, you didn't have a valid near-death experience. Uh, well, you did. Um, because everybody is grafting analytic overlay onto the experience. And they're just, you know, they're just not able to cleanly separate it out. And I, I want to get to point four right away uh, to, to illustrate how um, powerful this is. Sure. Let's let's um, do point four, and then after that, let's do some Q and A before we come to the end of the hour. Uh, go ahead okay. and 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 continue. Okay. Well, this will be a good finish then. For <clears throat> okay, so point four is the simple thing that the brain does in fact make stuff up all the time, and believe it to be real. And when I was a medical student, um, I uh, had the opportunity uh, to uh, work on a neurology floor where uh, patients had had their, their brains split um, in half, you know, the communication between the brain severed, and they do that uh, to treat uh, intractable seizures. But now you're left with somebody that has two separate functioning brains that can't talk to each other anymore. And so <laughs> uh, these, these experiments, uh, they sound kind of 
kind of mean, but um, so it was my job to drip water on the hand, you know, the the uh, non-dominant hand, the the hand that is uh, not hooked up to, you know, our language center is our left brain. So I would drip water on the part of the body. Um, the you know the left hand is uh, coordinated by the right brain, so I drip water on it. And then I would, you know, the person wouldn't know. The left brain would have no idea why there was water uh, on his hand. And so I'd ask him. I'd say, well, how come there's water on your hand? And they never said stuff like, oh, I don't know. Instead, they would just make stuff up. They would say things like, oh, it was Dang. raining before uh, I came in today. Wow. Or, oh, that That's nurse spilled water on my hand or or, you know, and, and usually it was within their fears or their, you know, they'd say things like that. It's manufactured by, or by subconsciously they manufacture manufactured. Stuff and they believe it to be true. Like so, subconsciously. That, you know, let, let's get the questions and the answers because it, it's a complex question then when we say, but is it real? And yet we know from remote viewing that there can be a real signal but it can go undergo tremendous distortions by the brain in its efforts to understand it. Oh boy. Okay, and we're, we're really going down the rabbit hole and that's exactly where I wanted to go. Uh, so we're, I'm going to, I'm going to start with, uh, uh, Kaylin, uh, we'll let you go first. Uh, you're, you're on with, uh, Dr. Morse. Uh, yes. Uh, how hard is it to be taught remote viewing? easy controlled remote viewing first of all i would only Good learn question. controlled remote viewing uh, uh, controlled remote viewing was developed by the military to be taught to military recruits mm -hmm. <laughs> and they had this idea that um they were going to have this you know these uh they, they're going to have you know <laughs> squadrons of uh of uh soldiers who were uh you know psychic soldiers um, it was developed by uh, Ingo Swan uh, and um, the Stanford Research Center and, you know, funded by the CIA. And that was their, it was, uh, you know, the initial uh, uh, research on it was done at Fort Meade. And that was their idea, was that they were going to just teach re recruits. Anybody can learn it. Um, Real Project Stargate, but, gentlemen. Yeah, there's a, a whole protocol to it. And that's the whole deal about it, as long as you follow the protocol. You know, people always like engineers will say to me things like, oh, I, I don't have a psychic bone in my body. I can't remove you. And I'll say you're the perfect person to remove you. You're an engineer. You can follow the instructions. And as long as you follow the controlled remote viewing protocol, uh, you'll be able to remove you. And I, I was going to just quickly tell you that um, I studied uh, the ability of uh, remote viewers to identify whether a plant was infected with a virus or not. And uh, I thought it might have implications uh, for AIDS research. But oh, wow. um, we, we studied, we had uh, controlled remote viewers and we had five other protocols. And the five other protocols were no better than chance. And the controlled remote viewers, uh, you know, just totally rocked it. They were, they were like, I don't, you know, 67, 80% accurate. Some of them as much as 95% uh, accurate uh, in their ability to assess whether the virus was in the plant or not. Wow. Wow. Uh, in, in, and in keep in mind what people say that, you know, that the brain makes stuff up and believes it to be true. Uh, what, what usually what I see in the non-controlled remote viewing world is people remote view stuff and then they twist the target or they twist the situation to somehow make it seem like they actually did it. Whereas in the control remote viewing world, they never do that. To, to get, tell you how accurate they are, uh, uh, they, um, Paul Smith, who's one of my instructors, tells a story of uh, uh, he was uh, supposed to remote view this uh, site and instead he remote viewed a, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the guys that were going out to the site uh, to have him remote view it, they stopped uh, and they had uh, lunch somewhere, and he ended up remote viewing that. And so, you know, everybody hears that story and they go, "Wow, you know what a great job you did." And he goes, "No, we call that a myth." <laughs> you know, <laughs> whereas in the non-controlled remote view, 
they usually try to twist stuff like that into a hit. And uh, at least in that one study we did, uh, it's really, I would learn controlled remote viewing or I wouldn't learn remote viewing at all. Wow. All right. And like I said, I'll teach you to do it. It's it, remote viewing is done in pairs. So if two of you want to learn at the same time, yeah. I'll teach you. I'd be happy yeah. To I would love to learn this. That'd be awesome. Sure. That would, that'd be rocking dude. Yeah. It'll take us we, a we, we've been to... playing a, to do an experiment anyways, and I've been contemplating who I wanted to, to pick for this. Cause I have several colleagues who are parapsychologists, but uh, man, since you're offering, we'll, we'll take you up on it. Sure. All right. Uh, I want you Jake. to learn the right way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that's how what I want. I, I don't I don't want to I, I, I want to walk by faith and science, man. That, that's my yeah. thing. I, I think they're in a world. Well, man. here's the deal. I'm dealing with having to tell grieving parents whether near death experiences are real or not. And nobody is a more cynical or bitter critic than a grieving parent. Because right. they don't mm -hmm. they don't want to be told what they want to hear. They don't want to be placated. They don't want people, you know, they get enough of that. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, your child's in heaven, your child's in a better place, you know, blah, blah, blah. They've already heard all that and they hate it. And so, you know, that's why I really wanted to learn the discipline of controlled remote viewing and make sure it's a real deal, because that's at least one piece of the near death experience that I can uh, say is true. You know, I don't, you know, I don't know how we can prove if there a loving God exists, but there's no doubt that this world is an informational universe and we all can access it. Wow. Jake, you're up. Yeah. So um, first of all, thank you very much for the, uh, the explanations that you've been giving us and the stories. Oh, you my, main question, yeah. my main question, my main question, Going back to looking at um, near-death experiences and hearing these stories, um, we talked about the mind kind of creating its own interpretations. Is Are there any consistencies that you could see, like if you were to, to write them all down, um, each, you know, each story would have, or at least the majority of them would have some consistency to it? Absolutely. And here's what it is, though. Uh, you know, I just, <laughs> I, this is uh, disappointing for people who want to mine the near-death experience for visions of heaven. Um, I, I don't think that that's a useful uh, uh, exercise. Here's the deal. We're conscious and aware and awake at the point of death. And our consciousness extends beyond our ordinary body. So, you know, when I trained at Johns Hopkins, you know, being a medical student, I thought when we died, you know, that was it. You know, the consciousness switch turned off. And that is absolutely not true, that um, the consciousness switches on and, and is much uh, greater uh, than. So, um, for example, a, a I think a, a very uh, underrated study was done by the National Warfare Institute where they took pilots to try to understand what force, you know, what uh, level of G-forces can they tolerate uh, before they black out? Because uh, obviously they don't want their planes going faster than, uh, you know, pilots can, uh, you know, uh, can fly them, um, right. you know, without blacking out. So they whirl them in these centrifuges. Uh, the uh, chief investigator of this study is, uh, he's a guy I met at NIDS at the National Institute of Discovery Sciences, uh, Jim Winery. And so, you know, he told me about this study. And here's the deal. They, uh, pilots would black out. They kept the centrifuges running. They would, you know, have seizures, vomit, loss of muscle tone, uh, you know, be in uh, the early stages of coma. And then right at the point where theoretically blood has stopped flowing in their brain, consciousness would return to these pilots and they would become awake and aware. They would often have out-of-body experiences, uh, but one uh, guy said that he saw bumper cars and he started laughing. He said, it was the most joyful, wonderful experience I've ever had. That's incredible, I, you know, I think man. I was on, I was on bumper cars, 
So wow. the actual, so, okay. So, so we're awake and aware and we have some perception of this universal love and joy, something that we've never experienced in this life. And it, to the, those who experience it, the adults will say things like, you know, that they learn from this experience that life has something to, to do with learning to love like that, you know, like that love that they encounter at the end of life, or more importantly, to be loved and to accept the love that others have for us. Absolutely. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, so that's, um, if you ever have a chance to uh, 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 go to my website and yeah, go to Melvin Morse MD. Yeah, it's MelvinMorseMD.com. And then go to Children's Near Death Experiences. And way at the bottom of the page is the best near death experience I've ever heard. It's by a guy named Dr. Kennedy. Um, and uh, watch his uh, near death experience. It's just amazing. But so th- those are really the only, the only things that you can say are, um, you know, that, that you're awake and aware and you perceive this loving God. And you feel like that somehow you've learned a lesson of love. Somehow life is about learning lessons of love. Um, and, and that then comes to everybody in a different way. You know, uh, many people have life reviews in which they get that sense of that they were here to learn lessons of love. But many people don't. Um, you know, many people, uh, you know, uh, meet relatives, uh, people that are important to them. Uh, but many people don't. Um, uh, children. Uh, <laughs> one uh, a girl uh, that we studied, she said that her living teacher and her living classmates were there during her near-death experience. So, you know, the, the only thing I can think, <laughs> since they weren't actually wild. there, <laughs> you know, but, you know, for her, you know, maybe she didn't have a dead grandmother. Maybe she didn't have a you know, uh, you know, somebody that was important in her life who had passed, you know, for, you know, the average elementary school teacher, uh, excuse me, you know, student, their teacher is so important. And so that's how this experience then uh, presented to her was uh, that her living teacher was there. And, you know, so, so all of, to me, all of the uh, specifics have to do, they come from your own personality. You know, we die the life we live. You know, people ask me about hellish near-death experiences, for example. Well, sure, there's lots of hellish near-death experiences. Like Howard Storm. (laughs) Yeah, but guess who has them? People from the Bible Belt. Uh, Maurice Rawlings is a Tennessee cardiologist uh, who I met years ago. And, uh, you know, most of his patients have an actual belief in hell. And sure enough, during their near-death experience, they had, you know, visions of hell. So we die the life we lived, that's for sure. And it's, you know, it's reflected uh, in there. And, you know, people that get to arguing about, well, how come, you know, I didn't see my uh, mother or how, you know, how come you saw heaven that looked this way? And I saw heaven that looked that way, you know, are not understanding the whole concept of analytic overlay. I I have a theory about that. I want to I want to I want to share with you. Uh, actually, when we come back from break, um, that 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 was a great question, man. Mm-hmm. Um, did he answer your? Did you answer answer his question uh, to your satisfaction, Doctor Mor- Morse? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I think this is a p- good point to stop. Uh, we're going to pause for a short break, uh, but when we come back, uh, we have a lot of mo to go into. Uh, we're going deep, deep deep into the unknown today uh that you're listening to project stargate fringe research with doc our guest dr morse and we will be right back in just a second all right welcome back to project stargate fringe research uh we are here today with dr melvin morse and and we sure surely am glad are glad to have you thank you for being with us again welcome back dr morse and welcome back gentlemen um i wanted to before i hand the floor back off to you doctor i want to share a, a experience that one of my family members uh, had and 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 there's kind of a synchronicity with your appearance on unsolved mysteries i want to tell you this story okay so uh you know I, I was I'm 42. I was born in 1980, and I grew up in Mississippi. And uh, every uh, night when a new episode of that show would come on, we we would gather up on the couch, um, and that was our favorite show. Period. 
Um, and that's what I, I, rem- the funny thing is I, rem- I remember you from that show and I've actually followed, I, I still haven't had a chance to read your books, but I'm going to, it's, I, pr- I'm going to purchase your books really soon and, and read them one by one. But, uh, anyway, I remember the episode, uh, the first episode and segment that, uh, they did on NDEs and, Little did I know that would send me on a roller coaster ride of research years later on the subject. But wow. I remember, I me remember too. seeing you on that episode. I remember, and a week later, we went to see my grandparents in South Mississippi. And I, I've had paranormal experiences with them, by the way, like missing, we've had missing time. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, UFO uh, happenings, but anyway, we, there's there, there, there's a lot of uh, history with that. Um, I'll tell you about sometime if you ever want to listen to that. But uh, anyway, uh, my uncle, who my retired uncle and aunt, who would travel in an RV, they didn't have a home. They would travel all over the, the states and Canada uh, in an RV, and they happened to be in town and they wanted to visit. So. I got to see my uncle Lester. Um, that was his name. Uh, many years ago, he was kind of a rough character. Um, he um, uh, he was pretty pretty wild, very promiscuous. Um, got in trouble, drank a whole lot. Uh, I mean, just he was kind of a rough character in general. Uh, and he had some kind of surgery they were doing on his intestines. Um, long story short. Uh, something went it went really foul uh, during that surgery, and he left his body. And he was in a in, and I've and I've seen this scenario. This is one of the only scenarios that seems to repeat itself uh, in, in some of these experiences uh, to a degree. But he found himself in a valley. Uh, he was moving like faster than the speed of light in this valley. And then there's uh, of course the the light of God that he was going towards. Uh, he he didn't give a crap. He didn't know anything about God. He you know he didn't even know if he believed in God and in and, and, uh, the afterlife and this and that. Um, he did now. <laughs> he said he described. Yes, he did. He described a tree, a, a great tree, and uh, golden flowers in this valley. And I've seen that scenario. I can't tell you at least four or five, maybe four or five times that I remember reading accounts uh, that that matched that. But um, at any rate, I just found it interesting as they told me about it. Uh, my grandmother told me about it. They they were talking about it, and I and I went and asked them. I said, "Look, I ma'am, my mamma said that this you this happened to you," and he uh, it fundamentally changed him. Just like uh, my my friend Howard Storm, he uh, it fund- his fundamentally changed him, uh, uh, going from a complete uh, atheistic theology. Uh, no afterlife, no, no, no hocus pocus. Nothing out of our our paradigm exists. You know, and then to being a believer in a lot of things. So I just wanted to share that with you and get your thoughts. And right. then I'll hand the floor over to you. Well, so that shows you though the importance of understanding that we don't see reality, that we create a mental model, and that becomes our reality. And then. When you walk down the street, you're not actually seeing anything. You're really just seeing, you know, you're sort of checking in with your mental model. You're like, oh, okay, yeah, there's the sidewalk. There's this, there's that. I mean, think think about it. it you know, I'm going to describe this for you because you may never get a chance to see the PBS special on the brain. But um, the Eagleman, who's the uh, neuroscientist, he he shows us what it would be like if our eyes actually were video cameras and it's just sickening i mean you know you know it's it's like you're, 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 everything's moving so quickly and, and like it's the board on star and trek down and and, mm-hmm. and you actually can't perceive very much because everything is 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 floating past you so quickly and um it, it just you know and that's not the way the system works um you know we create a mental model so then when someone like uh it was your uncle yes sir my great uncle to be exact yeah when he has his near-death experience and his brain is essentially not functioning anymore then his mental model is gone and suddenly he realizes 
you know, that it was sort of a, a cage. It's a, it's a, you know, the, the brain is just sitting there inside your head, it, you know, in darkness. It, you know, it only knows what it perceives. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell you how many children have told me that um, suddenly they're aware of, you know, dozens of colors that don't exist in this reality. Um, sure, because, you know, they probably exist in the, the other 80% of the matter of this universe that we can't see. So we don't even have to think about other dimensions. We don't have to think about, uh, you know, uh, other uh, multiverse realities. This reality itself, we, we see only a tiny sliver of it. And, um, it, you know, so I think that that's why... It's, I'm learning a lot from this talk because uh, I'm suddenly understanding why when people have near-death experiences, they're like, wow. And then it opens them up to, well, maybe there are angels. Well, maybe there are aliens. Well, maybe there mm -hmm. are, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, maybe all these things that we thought of as coincidences really aren't co coincidences. Maybe they have connections, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just connections that we can't see. The, the, you know, and that opens up a big a big uh, can of worms, too, if you think about it, because let's say that's true. Let's say that we know definitively that all that's true. OK, Let, let's just say we, we'll probably never will. But let's say that, that we do me and you for sure. know, Right. Yeah. Well, that would that mean everything is preordained, like everything uh, time is everything is uh, free will partially only partially exists uh, and everything is preordained. Well, I like that you said partially exists. I think that that's right. It only partially exists. But it's, so that means it exists, though. That's the only thing I can fathom. Well, Mark, least. then <laughs> I want to like, all right, I'm going to just blow your mind even further then. I'm ready for um, it. Or, or maybe. <laughs> Y'all ready, guys? Let's, let's do it. One, two, okay. three. <laughs> yeah, here's... <laughs> So even the movement of pedestrians across a street can be predicted by mathematical formulas. Even the patterns of cars, even the dripping of water from a faucet. But I don't think that we can say, I liked what you said that it's partially, that it's partially free will because obviously each individual pedestrian you know, has the choice of saying, no, wait, wait a minute, I'm not going to go to school, I'm going to go home, you know, or for whatever reason might abruptly, you know, but nevertheless, when you look at, you know, so, so that's what uh, chaos mathematics, and that's what something called one over F fluctuations is all about. One over it, X, F fluctuations are mathematicians who spend all their time studying biological systems, and they find that, in fact, they're not random. But and by, and by the way, I, I, I all as a quick side note, doctor, uh, I also think that uh, the fourth dimension explains uh, it might explain how clairvoyance works. Uh, it might. I, I think it very might, because I think what we're doing is perceiving data uh, Correct. From, yeah. from the what I call the cosmic hard drive, which would be our D fourth dimension what do you think of that about that idea? absolutely I, I think that's spot on i don't even think that that's controversial or uh because you know information theory is now the reigning scientific theory. yeah and <laughs> so so what is information theory at its heart information theory is that patterns of information dictate material reality well that means that something immaterial is dictating the material. Well, once you start, and that's, I mean, that's the basis of cell phone technology. That's the basis of material science. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, you know, just on and on and on and on. Complex systems theory, you know, which predicts, you know, everything from, you know, again, you know, the engineers use it, uh, you know, in all sorts of scientific applications. Um, it, the biosphere can be predicted mm -hmm. through complex systems theory and complex systems theory, which is sort of a cousin to information theory, again, is saying that it's patterns of information dictate reality. Well, maybe at this point now we're just all talking about something, you know, using different words for the same thing, because if there's an immaterial forces that, that, that are all knowing and, and dictate 
<laughs> the patterns of this material reality. Hmm. You know, that sounds a lot like God. <laughs> you know? Right. I mean, you know, that's like what that's why I like dealing with children, because, they, you know, they don't get into all, you know, they just say, I saw God. You know, they don't right. know, well, I didn't see God. I saw a higher power, or, you know, or, you know, all, right. all this sort of, you know, parsings. Um but sure, you know, so so that's just a long uh, answer to saying, yeah, I agree with your theory. I, I think I, I not only agree with it, I think that it's it's scientifically valid. Well, I, I am far from being a scientist. I'm just a, a truth seeker. This I, I is wanna... an exciting area because I don't think that you have to be a scientist. In fact, I think that scientists are at a disadvantage because they only know their own field. So, for example, you know, neuroscientists may understand 1 over F fluctuations and how there's definite patterns of neur neuronal firing within the brain that, you know, that that are not random, that, that, that have, uh, you know, that some people call the signature of consciousness, but they don't know anything about near-death experiences. So they don't, you know, so they're not marrying that information with the knowledge that, oh, when people's brains stop functioning, they actually have an expanded sense of consciousness. You know, so they're spending all their time trying to go, well, hmm, it doesn't seem like I can figure out how the brain can generate consciousness, which they can't. And yet they're unaware of a whole field of study that you know, that explains why, you know, that, that consciousness actually uses the brain, not the other way around. And, you know, I, I think that this is an area where I agree, 180% agree. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's no different than mathematics or, you know, and, and there's been other times in history where, um, you know, non-scientists have made tremendous breakthroughs. And I, Kalen's I pretty, actually a lot smarter than I am. I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to concede to that. that. I'm not that. Hey, what do you? Smart. What's your take on this, Kalen? I believe it that this is possible. It makes sense because uh, when he mentioned about electronics, uh, it does have a certain element in it, quartz, which is known for uh, gathering information. So, Jake, he's smart too. What's your thought? <laughs> So um, one thing that that it seems like is really the root of this conversation that we talk about is um, the perception of color. We've uh, you've mentioned about um, you know maybe seeing these different colors or whatnot um, going into these near death experiences. I think one thing that we can uh, um, kind of look to as an example, kind of in our uh, our realm, so to say, is uh, some countries do not see certain colors. So um, I believe absolutely. I, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I believe it's it's Greece, even though their colors are blue and white. Um, blue is just a lighter shade of black. Um, I believe yes. that that that's Greece. I'm not sure if I'm correct on that. Uh, there's a country that does not see orange. It's just a different shade of red. Right. Um, yeah. So I think that's definitely um, a strong indicator of what might be um, lurking behind the curtains of our reality or what we perceive as reality. Well, I, I want to expand on what you just said, Jake, because um, okay, this, is a, this is a heartbreaking thing to me, is that people so often have profound spiritual experiences, mm -hmm. and yet they don't recognize them for what they are. And they don't feel that, you know, that science validates them, and it's extremely confusing. They're afraid of ridicule. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, which which goes to the point of, you know, we think that something's real if we can all describe it. You know, if, if, if I was there in the room with you and I looked at a chair and you saw the same chair that I see and someone else seems the same, same chair, then we all agree that it's a chair. But if I see a chair and you two don't see it, well, then, you know, you're thinking maybe I'm crazy, you know, or, you know, that something's, you know, and, and that's the state of the art with, unfortunately, with spiritual experiences, is that by definition, a spiritual experience is something that only a person can see. And then it becomes very troubling because 
Well, since we're used to validating things by other people agreeing that that's what it is, or you know, having a, a commonality of experience, that you know, that's what validates us for it. Well, that isn't the case. And and Jake, so going back to not only is it not the case, but when we're looking even at the issue of colors, that what we say is red. Or uh, I think it's actually brown. You know what we say is brown. There are certain cultures in Africa and in the Middle East. They don't call that brown. The you know, they purple. see sort of a brown green and give that a distinct color. Well, then we don't. We accept that as normal. We don't. You know, then start doubting. Oh my gosh. You know, I, I guess I'm just incompetent at seeing colors. I, I, I must. I must be hallucinating colors. I must have. You know, I, I must be imagining colors. It, it, none of that happens to us. And yet it's no different. It's the exact same process as spiritual experiences. It's just that we just don't see it because we all agree, at least within this culture of what a, you know, a certain color is. And yet you go to another culture, they, they don't agree with us at all. They have a, a completely different uh, view of it. And, and that, and, you know, so understanding how the brain works then I think will help people to uh, learn to trust their own intuition, to really start to say, hey, wait a minute, this happened to me and it was real. And I'll give you an example of this from, I told you about the uh, guy that, uh, the uh, young man that flipped over the, uh, you know, his car, they flipped over the edge of the bridge, sure. they went in the water and he was in the big noodle and everything like that. Mm -hmm. And then he says to me, um, but was it real? You know, so we, we talked about that, uh, you know, before the break. But what I didn't share with you was that then his mother turned to me and said, I want to know too, because if his experience was real, then my experience was real too. And this was her experience. Her experience was that when the rescuers finally pulled her from the car, um, they had smashed the windshield and uh, pulled her out through the, uh, you know, um, and had to reach in and get her seatbelt undone and all of that. Um, and they, they brought her to the edge of the riverbank. She looks over and there's her husband. And he's sitting on a rock right next to her, looking as real as, as you know, as, as, as we look to each other. And she looks at him and she says, you know, who, I mean, you know, just sort of, you know, like what's going on? And he looks at her and he says, everything is all right. You know, I don't want you to be worried. There, there's no reason to be worried. Everything is all right. And she says, wow. what do you mean everything is all right? You know, they're, they're rescue our son down there. Why aren't you down there helping out? Why are you just sitting on this rock just telling me everything is all right? And she's so angry, she starts to wave her arms at him. And then he just sort of disappears. You know, her, his arms just go through her and, and he just Dang. sort of disappears. Holy cow. Wow. In fact, he was not, uh, he, you know, he died, uh, you know, in the car. He was not, they weren't able to rescue him. Um, they, they weren't able to get him out of the car. So, you know, but she didn't even mention her experience because she thought it was just some sort of crazy widow's dream or just some sort of, you know, something like that. And yet learning that the near death experience was real, then validated for her that maybe this you know, these other types of spiritual experiences, ones that we can't validate. You know, if we had been there, we wouldn't have seen her husband. <laughs> you know, I mean, we wouldn't have, you know, so, uh, and, and yet knowing that the near death experience is real, then gave her validation that her experience was real. And I think that that's what, you know, we have to start to uh, build as a community, to start to realize that uh, spiritual visions are real, they're just perceptions that are so different than the mental model that we've created of this reality. They're, they're just outside of it. And um, that doesn't mean that they're any less real. We, we've invented this reality. Uh, you know, people say to me, well, what, didn't they just, you know, aren't these just hallucinations of the mind? Well, everything is a hallucination of the mind. <laughs> everything is created by our mind. 
So the real question is, is it a dysfunctional? Is it, you know, like hallucinations really are from dysfunction, you know, the, and we know what a hallucination is like. Uh, we know what a dream is like, and spiritual visions uh, aren't like any of those. They, they are like, they're just like this experience, except they're of something that other people can't perceive. And, you know, that once we become a little more humble and start to realize the point that Jake made that, you know, that we don't even see colors the way other cultures see colors, then uh, we'll be less likely, uh, you know, or we'll be more likely to um, listen to people's spiritual experiences and know that they were real. Wow, that's a great comment, Jake. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and thank you, Dr. Morse, for that great uh, answer. Um, let's talk about NIDS. Tell, tell me if you, if you, if whatever you now, now before we, let me disclaim this. If there's something you can't talk about, just say, I can't talk about it. I, I don't um, think that uh, there's anything, at least that I was involved with, with NIDS that I can't talk about. I mean, it's been, NIDS, I think it's been disbanded now over 15 years. They have. Uh, how did you get hooked up with uh, Mr. Bigelow and tell us about what all, what all you experienced and learned? Please. Well, Robert Bigelow is just a, a brilliant genius. Uh, he's one of the most important, uh, I think, intellectual figures uh, in this country, uh, you know, really internationally, and just an amazing guy. And uh, my take on him is that he really is no different than than you, Mark, or Jake, except he's got a billion dollars. And he's also had uh, experiences <laughs> you know, so, himself. So, so just like you have, uh, you know, you've got me to come on your show and you got a podcast and, you know, you get various people to come on your show. He has the resources that he can get the top cosmologists to come to his, uh, you know, his place in Las Vegas. And he can get U.S. senators to come and talk about uh, UFO research. And, you know, that's how I got involved with him is because of uh, my uh, children's near-death research. Um you know, but then he got also, you know, Bruce Grayson was, uh, you know, the, um, I think the, you know, Professor Emeritus at the University of Virginia, also a giant in near death studies. Um, you know, he just had, you know, and uh, if he heard about UFO uh, activity on a ranch in Utah, uh, he just bought it. <laughs> you know, it's a, what, a, what a great way to be able to study it. And is such a good businessman that uh, he made money in the process. Um, but, you know, what a pioneer. Um, when I was at NIDS, he could talk on the level of anybody, you know, that was in the conference room. Uh, he could talk uh, intensive care unit medicine with me, you know, just like I'm talking to one of, uh, you know, one of my, you know, fellow uh, intensivists. Uh, he could talk to the cosmologists on their level. Uh, he could, you know, just... And I mean, and look what he's doing. You know, he's yeah. he's. I'm not a bit surprised, a, by the way, that he picked you. Space. I, I'm not a bit he, surprised he picked you. Uh, you know, uh, in space, um, and they were successful. Uh, I think COVID kind of did them in, but uh, uh, you know, he's had uh, had some success with that. But then he used that as a, a vehicle to start to explore: Are there aliens? Um, you know, so you know, he's he has. You know, he has the ability, he's got mainstream scientific credentials and interests, and, um, you know, he's willing to take his uh, interests wherever they lead him, you know, whether it's aliens or currently he's uh, interested in uh, funding people who will, uh, 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 whether mediums can give us messages for humanity and whether, you know, uh, the, to give us some guidance at, at a time when, frankly, we need it. And, you know, and again, approaching it in an extremely thoughtful, uh, scientific way, you know, validating everything that they do. Uh, he's, you know, not a naive guy that's just sort of, you know, throwing his money around, but uh, is spending it very thoughtfully. So it, it was great. Uh, I saw him on Joe Rogan. He's brilliant. Yeah. And just, uh, you know, I learned uh, so much. Um, there, I mean, it, this is like, here's one thing that we did. You know, we've heard about alien abductions. So, uh, and people said that they came back with implants, you know, in their bodies. So, <laughs> Mr. Bigelow, <laughs> he, he actually um, invites them to come to Las Vegas, and then he has the implant surgically removed, 
and then he has him analyzed. Did Dr. Uh, Lear do, uh, or uh, what was his name that did the uh, implant surgery? I can't remember his name. Uh, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, you know who I'm talking about, right? Uh, yeah. it's, it's that doctor that, that was a, he was like a podiatrist or something. And then he started, uh, somehow he got into the, uh, implant removal business, which is, and I think he's very credible, but anyway, I just, I was just curious if, if you knew who I was talking to, it'll come back. His name I know. Back. I just don't remember his name. Cause I, it's been a long time ago since, you know, I was yeah. involved with that, but I mean, so, you know, that's just the kind of guy he is, you know, that's not, he's, you know, it's okay, well, let's have a look. Let's see what they actually are and sent him off to the University of New Mexico to be studied and uh, such as that. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, the most interesting thing he did was uh, the Utah Ranch. Uh, and the Utah Ranch, I think, uh, explains a lot of the uh, UFO phenomena that we've been talking about. And for those of you, for, of you who are unfamiliar with what he's talking about, uh, you may be familiar with the term skinwalker ranch uh and this is uh, in the uina basin in utah go ahead doctor mm -hmm. okay so um mr bigelow buys a ranch in utah and has just the top team you know the top veterinarians the top cosmologists you know everybody uh and they go out there and they they do their research and they have every kind of recording equipment They've got every, you know, they got, you know, things that are automatic and they've got all their handheld, uh, you know, sensors and, you know, cameras and, and, and everything. And, um, you know, there's a, lots of uh, things are going on all the time there. Uh, you know, they're finding cattle mutilations. Uh, they're finding uh, mysterious areas on the ranch where animals just will not go. Um, they, they, uh, you know, there, there seem to be uh, lasers uh, uh, carving, um, uh, you know, uh, gouging out uh, uh, marks and cliffs. But you know, <laughs> you know, you just, you know, it's all kind of like, is it really something? Is it really not something? Is this, you know, are we beating something into it? You know, nothing really, uh, you know, that that you can take home until one night when they're there that they have an actual encounter and they have an encounter with something that appears to be a ufo it's a bright light that's moving purposely and seems to be you know coming closer and closer to them while they're observing it so um wow, wow. i mean this is it you know this is this is the moment um, you know, so, so now we're, you know, we'll have documented proof the, of UFOs. I mean, this is obviously it. And yet, when the experience is all over, not a single of the remote cameras or various sensing has detected it. And um, the uh, human observers, they're just, they're so... You know, no one thought to just pick up, you know, a camera and take a picture of it. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and I can't tell how many times I've, I've been in that situation you, myself. So, you know, I mean, this is why, you know, I think that, you know, you, we have to be thoughtful because I think to, you know, to people who, you, you know, what, um, what, what do they call it? Uh, you know, confirmation bias. You know, I think there's, there's a lot of confirmation bias, particularly in the skeptical world. So the, the confirmation bias, people say, see, they couldn't get a picture of it, so it must not be real. No, these are intelligent, thoughtful. They're the top scientists. These are men uh, and women who, uh, they're not making stuff up. They're not having mass hysteria. You know, they're not, they're, they're skilled observers and they're telling us accurately what they observed. But then it also starts to bring up the correlations, in my opinion, between UFO uh, research and near-death research, which is- can I, can I pause you for one second really quick, uh, Dr. Sure. Morse? Um, I wanna share something with you uh, real, real quick that has to do with your abduct, what you were talking about with abductions. Um, I wanna share my screen real quick. This okay. is a, uh, a mark that I have on my, um, on my right uh, lower arm, I've had this. I've had this since I was 13. 
Actually, hang on. I'm sharing the wrong screen. Hang on. Whoa. Sorry about that. Well, let, let me know if you guys can see it. Uh, no, it's wrong one again. Hang on, just a minute. My apologies. All right. Hmm, that's weird. It's not letting me. Keeps sending me to my my Skype when my own. <laughs> my own this, is, this is exactly my point. Yeah, it's so it, interesting it, that you that you interrupted my story to tell this because that was my point. My point was that here is verifiable phenomena that we're not able to document with technology. Yeah, <laughs> this happens. The human it, could, it could be the it. operator too, but but it, yeah, <laughs> this happens. I'll have to send it to you. I, 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 now I, you're I, trying I'll, to show us something that, that that you can't it, document with technology. Yep, <laughs> you can't. I would see. It's like right here on my wrist. You're not going to be able to see it on my webcam, but I, what happened? It, it appeared on my wrist one night, um, uh, one morning actually, uh, the night before I awoke, uh, suspended in midair above my bed, um, probably three to five feet, uh, somewhere around that. In that, and I was paralyzed. I felt like I was suffocating, um, and then I impacted my bed. And the next morning, when I woke up, uh, that mark, this uh, scoop mark was on my uh, arm. And I'll send you af at later on uh, uh, after the program. I'll send you. A, oh, I'll send a picture, it. a high resolution picture of it, so see what you think. I've had Daryl Sims look at it, and I've had Kathleen Martin look at it, and they seem to they seem to think it correlate or it's uh, similar to what they've consistently seen. So, but uh, anyway. Just wanted to yeah. mention that to you. I was going to well, show it to you, but. <laughs> but I, I think that, you know, that so your, you know, the, your experience it, it fits, you know, that there's a reason you told that story right now, which is because my opinion, this is just an opinion, you know, I don't think we know, but I think that these experiences are similar to the near death experience in that they're not perceptions of this reality. That their except their perceptions that are mediated through our mind, you know, of you know of whatever of you know of the informational reality of the 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 the, what, the reality that one child told me it was real, Doctor Morris. It was realer than real, <laughs> you know. That you know the the informational universe. Uh, you know, I think that that's uh, you know where that uh, kind of information is coming from. And I think that, you know, you're having that sort of uh, out of body experience again, it's, you know, that's a marker for that you're not uh, associated anymore with your physical brain, that your consciousness is now uh, relocated itself to somewhere else in space. Uh, you know, your, your mental model is now uh, no longer uh, encased, you know, in, in, inside, inside your skull anymore in, in that dark space. But it, your your mind's expanded, and then whatever happened to you, it, you know, probably happened. You know, it's not outside of your ordinary memories. Of course, it is because your ordinary memories have to do with your ordinary perceptions and your uh, events in this ordinary life. Uh, you know, uh, you know that's all there's to it. There's no reason that you would remember stuff. Uh, there's probably not, not even any means of uh, saving or organizing those memories. Uh, when they uh, come to us, uh, you know, f from perceptions of, of this informational reality. Certainly, I know when, when you learn controlled remote viewing, you'll see that that's why you have to work in a team, is that the uh, viewer often doesn't remember anything that's happening. And so you have then a monitor who's carefully, uh, you know, assessing everything and helping the viewer to write everything down. And, you know, pretty much everything has to be uh, written down. Uh, because, uh, you know, afterwards, then it just sort of seems like a blur and, and can't be remembered. Uh, you know, we don't know exactly where memories are stored, uh, but it doesn't surprise me that experiences that occur outside of this current men mental uh, model uh, don't, the, those memories aren't stored along with the memories from the mental model, that's for sure. I think that, I think it's possible um not not certain but very possible that memory is in consciousness that period is just is remote and i think that it's also possible that our brains like i said earlier is kind of like a more or less a biological processor that to process the signal for or whatever it is uh, so you're in. saying you're not a scientist and all of that but um <laughs> your opinion 
happens to match the opinion of the most uh, renowned memory scientist, a guy named Fred Lashley, who's the father of modern memory research. And wow. he said at the end of his career, you know, if I didn't know better, I would think memories weren't stored in the brain. <laughs> So, I've heard that somewhere. I've heard that somewhere. That that's really amazing, man. Uh, thank you for for bringing the t that to my attention. But yeah, now, uh, I didn't mean to get us all way off I the beat. Go path. back to your experience before, because you know one pet peeve of mine is the term paranormal. You know, or you you guys talk about that you're fringe scientists. You know, etc. Um, and then you tell us this story. You know, of hovering out of your body, you know, and that sounds like a really weird story, it, you know, probably something you just made up, no doubt, um, you know, um, but it's not paranormal at all. In fact, a guy named David Hufford at the University of Pennsylvania has studied those experiences worldwide in every, well, I, I can't say every culture, but most every culture, you know, that, that he studied, you know, be they, primitive cultures in, uh, you know, the Amazon or, uh, you know, tribal cultures in Africa or um, you know, modern American culture, Canadian culture, European culture, probably three to five percent uh, of the people have had experiences exactly like yours. Now, not necessarily the, uh, you know, the scar on the wrist, but that perception that that uh, that uh, you know that they call it you know the some cultures call it the terror that comes at night you know this sense of sort of sleep paralysis uh, you know and then being completely awake uh, being aware that your body can't move is below you um, that's not paranormal that's actually normal <laughs> it's it normal and um, it, it's it well uh, you know. You know, three to five percent of the people that are uh, hearing this have had that exact same experience. Um, you know, that's more than the, the people that have been to Russia, and we all believe Russia exists. So, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I just wanted to point that out that, um, you know, that once we start to uh, study, in fact, when I talk to skeptics, uh, people who, you know, are so certain that near death experiences, are, you know, it's just a bunch of baloney. When you sit down and really talk to them, they've had spiritual experiences. Some of them had experiences that you could start a religion with. It's just, you know, a lot of their skepticism comes because, again, they can't find any validation. And they look around the world and they see a lot of con artists and they see a lot of people that are making money off their spiritual experience and that somehow turns them off. Well, come on, you know, we're human beings. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> human I, beings are con artists and they want to make money off their experiences. I mean, you know, that's, but that doesn't mean they're not real. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that, that's, right. that's for sure. I, I didn't mean to get us so far off the beaten path, um, but, uh, no, Doc, but that was awesome. This is the path. Um, this is the path. This is, this so, is when you start to ask that question that that young man asked me, are these experiences real? This is where it ultimately leads to, because we start wondering, well, how can something that 3% of the population experiences be so overlooked that, you know, that, that nobody is willing to really talk about and, uh, you know, other than on shows like this and people who uh, hear about the experience go, oh, come on, you know, he must be. And yet 3% of the population has it. I mean, we have to expand our sense of what is reality and we, we have to bring all of it in. But this, I, I wanted to make this point earlier, Mark, so I'm, I'm gonna make it now. Now is another problem. Um, the, the, this is a problem I think that uh, remote viewing helps us to sort out because when we're trying to understand these experiences, like the experience that happened to you, we have that problem of analytic overlay that I talked about uh, at the last uh, hour. And, you know, uh, it, th this is, I think, what is, uh, we have to get out of this, this skeptic versus believer debate because the skeptics are wrong, but the believers, often their minds are so open that their brains have fallen out. I mean, the, it, 
that we have to understand that, um, well, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about uh, and the importance of controlled remote viewing and sorting all this out. I taught a shaman to do controlled remote viewing. And um, the first uh, target that I gave him was uh, some roses that a man left in the river uh, where his uh, wife, um, he, 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 uh, his wife, he and his wife uh, would go there uh, throughout the, their, you know, their courtship and their life together. And then uh, when she passed, uh, he would go there and leave roses in the river. Okay, so I thought this would be a great target for a shaman. And he was very, Absolutely. you know, in fact, very unique. You, you asked this question earlier, you know, you said, well, you've heard about people that just tell you that, you know, that first thought into your mind, that must be the right one, you know, you know, all that, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so this shaman, he did a great job. He got all the sensories. He got the sound of water. He's got the roses, you know, he got the red of the roses. He got the sharpness of the thorns. You know, he got all of that. And then he got the sense of overwhelming loss. And then he also wow. happened to be an urban planner. <laughs> and so he immediately then went to the slums of Detroit and he started describing to me a dying, decaying city and um, buildings that were, you know, half destroyed and rubble and, you know, wow. and all, all these descriptions of destruction of an inner city. And and he was certain that he was right. There's, you know, one thing that you'll learn, you know, when we do controlled remote viewing is whether you're certain or not of that you're correct about the target is meaningless. Uh, you could be uncertain about the target and nail it, and you can be certain and be totally wrong. And he was totally wrong. But when I finally revealed the target to him, then at least he had the humbleness to see what had happened to him. And what happened was he was right up until the sense of loss. And then unfortunately for him, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but I mean, unfortunately for a successful viewing for him, a sense of loss meant something very different for him than the sense of loss from the target. Um, and who knows, you know, when, when I talked to him more, he had had some terrible experiences also with the loss of a wife. So it may have been that the target was too overwhelming for him. That, uh, you know, that when he started to brush up against that sense of the loss of a wife, then he himself went to destroyed buildings and rubble and, you know, and, and, and such as that. But, you know, now he's incorporated controlled remote viewing into his shamanism and he's totally, you know, but by having some humbleness, um, you know, and getting his ego out of the way. Because, you know, think about it. When you say, I'm right, I know that this is right. Well, that's your ego. Well, your ego is your left brain. Well, your left brain is probably not right when it, you know, comes to uh, spiritual uh, insights and intuitions. That's, that's a right brain phenomena by and large. And I'm using those terms very roughly, uh, you know, for the neurologists that are listening. Yeah, I'm quite aware that lots of left brain functions are on the right side of the brain and lots of right brain mm -hmm. functions, left side of the brain, blah, 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 blah. But nevertheless, uh, those are, uh, I think, useful, uh, uh, you know, ways of understanding how the brain works. And it just... So we can't start to understand paranormal experiences unless we're also very humble and start to say, you know, I, I, I love your description of your experience because it's very much like a child's description. It's so clean and pure, you know, but let's face it, there's lots of people that have experiences like yours and then they graft on to their own analytic overlay and they start to, you know, to say, yeah, and, you know, this happened to me and I was taken up by a flying saucer and aliens operated on me and, you know, which may be correct or may not be correct or, you know, maybe just, you know, all stuff that's coming from their own mind. But that doesn't mean they've made the whole thing up, you know, no different than the shaman. You know, the shaman is just, you know, they call it, they, it's not making it up. They call it sandcastling. He's, the, he's, that's a distortion of the signal line, you know, once, once he starts to add his own elements to it. And I, I think that, you know, that's the, 
That's the difficulty when we're looking at so-called paranormal uh, phenomena, but we have the same problem with the ordinary phenomena. Um, and, the, and the neuroscientists love, they love to play tricks on the mind. You know, they've got mm. all different kinds of ways. They, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen these things where they, they have all these, uh, they'll, they'll put like a, a paragraph with all these misspellings and mistakes in it, and you read through it and you're completely unaware. You know, until until, uh, you know, until you get to the last sentence, you know, that says, hey, go back and count how many, uh, you know, misspellings there were that you missed. Um, you know, we do it all the time. Uh, we, you know, we misperceive reality. And it's, we're uh, we're approach, quickly approaching the, 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 uh, in the end of the hour. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off, uh, sir. Um, I wanted to give uh, the, them uh, a, an opportunity to uh, get some question, get a little Q&A in, if that's OK. Um, and then um, if you want to, we can, uh, I like, I know we're not even close to being done talking about this. Yeah, uh, maybe sometime sure. in the near future, if you'd be willing to come back, I'd, I'd like to talk more yeah, about it. Because, teach you the remote view. Let's have, let oh, me yeah. teach you the remote view and then let, let me bring you back. Yeah, let's, I think that's a great idea. What do you guys think? Uh, I, wouldn't, I, mean, I wouldn't mind. Cool. Okay, well, we'll do that. Um, but it, well, Jake, kick, uh, you're on with uh, Dr. Morse. Oh, man. Um, so I'm going to go to Skinwalker Ranch just because that is one of the, the main things that's gotten me interested in this. Um, in your experiences at Skinwalker Ranch, if one thing stood out to you, uh, what was the biggest uh, phenomenon that you witnessed or experienced? Great question. Thank you for asking that. Oh, you know. It was well named the Skinwalker Ranch because it's sort of a textbook of all the different types of uh, psychical phenomena. And I, I wouldn't say this is something that I observed, but something that I've just sort of, uh, that's my impression, is that that's a site that has been there for thousands of years and has been... Uh, uh, haunted perhaps or you know possessed or you know we talked about that there's uh, uh you know 80 percent of the universe that we can't see uh, inhabited by uh you know that that must be one of those places that intersects with this reality in which you know it's sort of a uh, you know i mean these are all just uh, metaphors which you know don't really do justice to what's really happening but some sort of a portal uh, and I think that uh, that's the, the best way uh, that I can understand it. It's a, it's a portal to um, maybe to dark matter, you know, to, to uh, whatever uh, inhabits dark matter. Uh, we're made of matter, you know, uh, so why wouldn't conscious evolved beings uh, be also uh, made of, uh, you know, it's not really dark matter, you understand. It's just matter that we can't see. That's what we call it, dark Thank that, you for that's clarifying what, that's that. That comes out of me. It's a, some sort of shape-shifting reality. Sure, sure. Kind of like a crossroads where the two are almost like a Venn diagram where two realities or dimensions may intersect. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's what, sure. you know, it's certainly, uh, it certainly is, you know, they, I mean, the, the NIDS board had every kind of scientist you uh, want and, you know, every effort was made to explain it away. Uh, you know, there's a, there's, there's a, I think, a Air Force base or, you know, military base that's nearby. You know, there's, you know, any number of explanations uh, that were all shot down. Um, and so you're sort of left with this kind of amorphous, yeah, we know something's there and we don't know what it is. Sure. Have you had a UFO sighting out? Did you ever have a UFO sighting yourself out there or have you ever had a UFO sighting or I've anything like that? I've never had a UFO sighting. I, I I haven't. Just curious. Yeah. Dude, uh, Jake, good question. Do you have anything else for him? Nope that uh, that was it for tonight. Um, you know, next time I'm sure we'll have more to discuss. Absolutely, this this has given you a lot to chew on. Uh, this also goes with some of the conversations we've had about parapsychology. I'm I'm trying to educate 
uh, my team, my team about the the basic concepts of parapsychology and NDEs is a really big the death the death survival part of it in general is a really big part of it. Um, Kalen, you're on with Dr. Morse. Do you think that dreams and uh, the other stuff you said could be more connected or just another extension for the consciousness in a certain way? Mm, a specific type of dream. Um, the uh, the specific a, a type of dream that they call them lucid dreams. Yes, they're dreams in which you think you're awake, and you don't really you know have that sense you're dreaming. That you um, have the ability to control in the dreams. Absolutely, and I uh, I did a study of this. Um, of I studied uh, women who had dreams of uh, sudden infant death, uh, you know, that their babies died of uh, sudden infant death. Mm. And uh, I carefully looked at what were the types of dreams and intuitions that people had whose babies didn't die of sudden infant death. You know, so that's, you know, that's a typical kind of thing. You know, a mother would tell me, you know, I was sitting in the living room and suddenly had this feeling that my baby died and I ran upstairs and my baby was fine. Um, you know, that, that's a, a typical kind of experience uh, that uh, uh, mothers uh, commonly have. Uh, or uh, we were told, you know, many types of, you know, just ordinary dreams. You know, I had a dream in which I was watching my baby, uh, you know, uh, was in a casket and uh, everybody was crying. But it was an ordinary type of dream, meaning that kind of dream that you don't really know where it starts, and you don't really know where it ends, and it just sort of has flashes, and you know, it's everything sort of jumbled together, and when it's over, you don't really remember it that well. Then I looked at the dreams of uh, mothers uh, who had babies who died of uh, sudden infant death, and sure enough, uh, they had these very vivid, uh, lucid style dreams. You know, typically they'd say is like. Unlike any dream I'd ever had before, I was, uh, you know, I thought that I was awake, um, you know, and then, and then, you know, their dream would have uh, some uh, aspect of uh, premonition uh, of the uh, sudden infant death. Uh, so, you know, that's a, a, a we looked at that, uh, you know, our, our research teams looked at that uh, question uh, very carefully. We also looked at uh, the dreams of uh, children who had near death experiences and then uh, interviewed them again as adults and looked at what kind of dreams that they had. And again- Oh, found, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, we found that uh, when they grew up, they had uh, um, you know, six, seven times the number of those types of psychical dreams uh, that our control populations had. Yes, that is absolutely true. I can concur with that, doctor. And by and large, their dreams came true. You know, it's a, you know, a, a, like a control population. Here's a dream from a control population, uh, uh, you know, study person. Uh, you know, she, uh, this uh, uh, woman told me, she said, you know, I had this dream uh, that I was driving uh, down the highway and I was going to see my dad and he had just died. Um, and he hadn't died. <laughs> you know, she woke up and called her dad right away and he was alive. In contrast, the people who had near death experiences you know, they would have the type of dream where, um, you know, I woke up, it was the middle of the night, my dad was standing at the foot of the bed, and he was saying to me, you know, call your mother. It's really important that you call your mother and tell her that I'm okay. And then they'd wake up and call their mother and find out that their father had passed. Um, and, you know, we, and we studied the, you know, the, like I said, you know, the six, seven times uh, more likely uh, to uh, those types of dreams and people that had near-death experiences. Hmm. Wow, that's fascinating. Inter interesting. Yeah, I would pay attention to any dream that you didn't think was a dream. You know, the the, the hallmark. I'll, I'll tell you the two hallmarks of of, of, of valid spiritual experiences. Uh, one is when people say it's like, uh, you know, it was a dream, but it wasn't like any other dream I ever had before. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other mm -hmm. thing people say is, you're going to think I'm crazy, but, and then they tell you this amazing spiritual experience. I think whenever I hear, hear it prefaced by, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I know I'm going to hear something really great. 
That's a wow. reflection on our society, unfortunately. We're, mm -hmm. we're sort of a, a spirit-denying society. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, we cut off the most important part of our humanity by doing so. Agreed. Much, 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 much agreed. agreed. Added. Yeah. Good, good call, man. Um, Dr. Morris, uh, we're, we're about to run out of time. Um, you, I, I'm, I cannot wait to have you back on the show again. But sure. before, uh, but, uh, could you tell uh, our viewers and listeners uh, about your books and where we where they can buy them and your web, and repeat your website, uh, if you don't mind? Okay. My website, it's easy. It's MelvinMorseMD.com. So M-E-L-V-I-N-M-O-R-S-E-M-D.com. Uh, that's easy enough. And I got you know, all the great videos of children's uh, experiences, um, you know, and, uh, you know, go into a lot of, you know, stuff on remote viewing, spiritual healing, etc. I've, I've had a long career um, and, and a blessed one. But um, uh, my books, you can just buy them on Amazon. Um, I, you know, I wrote uh, Closer to the Light, um, which is about the near-death experiences of children. And I'm really proud of because I was the first book with the to the light <laughs> title. <laughs> I'm so I'm so proud of that. You, you know, did, then afterwards there was embraced by the light and after the light and you know into the light. Anyway, so <laughs> it must run in the family. <laughs> then there's a transformed by the light, which was a study of uh, adults had near death experiences as children. I wrote parting visions which were the premonitions of death, the shared dying experiences. I mean, it's just, uh, wow. I want to get into that next next time, by the way. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I, I really want to get into that deep. I, I am, Parents, I've just started researching Dying experiences it. of their kids. I mean, it's just incredible. After death communications. This is amazing. And then I wrote another book called Where God Lives. Uh, and that's a book about uh, how our brains are connected to the universe. You know, going mm -hmm. to, our brain is a spiritual brain. Um, and, you know, I'll just tell you another thing I'm proud of, Mark, uh, and, and, you know, and Jake and Devin. Um, I wrote uh, Where God Lives uh, in 2006. Um, and since then, the only comment from the scientific community has been to say, no, you're wrong. It's not a God spot. It's a God brain. <laughs> so, you know, nobody has uh, argued with my fundamental thesis. Um, it, it, people have argued whether there really is a God. A guy wrote a, a book called The Spiritual Doorway to the Brain, in which he thinks that near-death experiences, you know, are not necessarily real, but he still agrees with the idea that we have a spiritual brain. And a guy named um, Mario Beauregard wrote The Spiritual Brain, which he said, you know, Dr. Morris is wrong. Um, it's actually a third of our brain is a spiritual brain. But nevertheless, modern neuroscientists by and large buy that uh, consciousness uses the brain, um, it, you know, that the, and there's not really a model for how the brain can create consciousness. Wow. I tell you what, man, this mm -hmm. has been riveting. I um, this is one of the best interviews we've we've done in, in quite a while. And, well, uh, thank you. and we have some pretty awesome people on my show. And, and I just can't thank you enough. Uh, for Dr. Morse for your time. Um, I just uh, I just want to thank you and uh, looking forward to working with you again soon. Looking forward we'll to get all, got all that set up to, uh, here in the next week or so. All righty. Sounds great. Okay. Right. Yeah, give me a call tomorrow. All right, sir. Mm. Thank you. And thank you. You, you, you're listening to Project Stargate Fringe Research with our special guest, uh, Dr. Melvin Morse. And please check out his uh, books. And also, if you enjoyed this video, Please hit that like and subscribe button, if you will. That'd help us out a lot. And everybody take care. Have a blessed day. Until next time, have a good night.